Well, summer has finally arrived here in Colorado Springs. Actually, about two weeks ago, we were having some pretty good snow and winter storms all the way up until that time. But it is so nice out today that I thought instead of going down to the office, we can shoot this video out on the back deck. Today, we're looking at Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac in the book of Genesis. So let's get some coffee and dig into this story. You're watching The Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Parrott. The goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching within the classroom of the seminary and break those walls wide open so that anybody in the world on YouTube can watch these videos. So if you like this channel, you know what to do. Number one, tell your friends about it. Subscribe to the channel. Give it a thumbs up and leave comments down below. This is an experiment to see how it goes filming out here on the back porch. I'm not sure if the sun's gonna come on and create too harsh of a light or fire sirens or planes going to fly over, but let's see how it goes and we'll include some shots of the garden as we go along the way here. Now after a lengthy and much longer than any other character so far in the book of Genesis and a very spotty career, we now come to the final and definitive passage in the story of Abraham. The story of Abraham as it's recorded in the Bible is a story that's filled with all kinds of moral problems. Twice he tells other kings that his wife is his sister and they take her away to be their wife. In an ill-conceived attempt to have the promised seed, Sarah takes her slave and gives her to Abraham to produce a child. Abraham goes along with the plan and it's sexual abuse at its very worst. And for Hagar, who is a slave, she has no say or choice in the entire matter, yet it's her body and her child. No wonder the text tells us in 16.4, that Hagar despised Sarah. And then when Hagar is pregnant, Sarah treats her so harshly that Hagar flees only to be rescued by an angel and returned to Abraham. And then when Sarah hears that Ishmael is laughing or mocking Isaac, she demands that Abraham send Hagar and the child away. Even though Ishmael appears to have been very precious to Abraham at that time, he consents. If anything, Abraham and Sarah give me hope in an odd sort of way. If God could use them, then he can use me as well. And this brings me back to one of the big character traits that run throughout the Bible. The main characters are flawed characters. We see all their side. And with Abraham, it is his obedience and trust in God that is his strength, not his moral shortcomings. This week, we arrive at the Akedah, or the story of the binding of Isaac in Genesis 22. But before we jump into that, I want to quickly show you how this story fits into the entire narrative of Abraham's life in Genesis 12 through 22. First, I want you to notice that Genesis gives us almost as much space to the story of Abraham as it has from creation up until this point. That should let you know the importance of Abraham's story to the book of Genesis and also how the first 11 chapters really serve as setting the stage. It's sort of the prologue to the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible. This story has a very highly structured chiasm to it. And by a chiasm, this comes from the Greek letter chi, shaped like the letter X in English. And what it means is that the author walks you into the story and then walks you out of the story. And what happens in the first half is balanced with what happens in the second half. This is what is a traditional Middle Eastern and Greco-Roman style of telling stories. Now let's take a look at how all this plays out. At the very start in Genesis 11:27, we are told that we have the generations of Terah. And then in chapter 22, verses 20 through 24, we get into the generations of Nahor. If we go back to the beginning, we have sort of the second level of this narrative ring. In chapter 12, one, we have the Laklaka, the command for Abraham to go. This is matched on the other end 
in chapter 22, verses 1 through 19, with the binding of Isaac. In 12, 7, we have the command, to your seed I will give this land. And then in chapter 21, we actually have the birth of that promised seed. The fourth ring is where Sarah is given to Pharaoh. And then at the very end of the story, we have a fourth ring again. This time, Sarah is taken by the king of Gerar and returned in 20 verses 1 through 18. In the fifth ring, we have the story of Sodom. Lot lives there and he's going to be captured and then Abraham has to rescue him from the kings that are invading the land. In the fifth ring down below, we have Lot being rescued from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And finally, towards the very middle of this story, we have Sarah's statement that she is childless in 15.2. And this is matched with Sarah being told that she will have a child in 1810. And then right towards the middle here, we have the Abrahamic covenant in chapter 15. And this is matched by the circumcision or the sign of the covenant in 17. And then the very middle of Abraham's story is that of Ishmael, chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. Three key moments in Abraham's life. At the start, we have the lek leka, you go. In the very middle, we have the attempt by Sarah and Abraham to fulfill God's promises through their own means. Sarah takes her slave, gives her to Abraham, for Abraham then to produce a child with her. It is a story of sexual and slavery abuse. And then finally, at the very end of this, we have the Akeda, or the binding of Isaac. Now, normally we would expect the most important lesson to occur at the center of the story. This is where the story of Ishmael occurs, but I think this story follows a pattern laid down for us in Genesis 4. Remember in that story, the bulk of the story is taken up with God's dealings with Cain. It is not until the very end that Eve learns her lesson and has a third child, Seth, who she calls God's gift or God's promise to replace the child that died. So let's take a look at the first three verses of Genesis chapter 12. Sometime after these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him up there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will indicate to you. Early in the morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took two of his young servants with him, along with his son, Isaac. When he had cut the wood for the burnt offering, he started out for the place God had spoken to him about. Now, throughout the centuries, many ideas and interpretations about what this chapter is about have been put forward. Many have argued that this story is primarily aimed against the practice of child sacrifice. They argue that because Abraham goes along with this request, it illustrates his pagan background and thus would have been a practice he would have been familiar with from Ur. In the early Jewish commentaries on this story, the rabbis wrote that before Abraham left Terah's household, Abraham smashed all of his father's idols, which illustrates his breaking from his pagan practices and his past. And this story continues that trajectory. The problem with this view is that there's not a great deal of evidence for the prevalence of child sacrifice in the ancient Near East. There were select instances of this, but rather it appears to have been something that one religion would level as a charge against another to show how horrible that other religion was. It's sort of like the conspiracy theories that the Democrats were running a child sex and cannibalism ring from inside Pizza A Go Go in Washington, D.C. And if you want to discredit someone, why not spread the most vicious and vile lies about them? The narrator gives us inside information in verse 1, information that Abraham would not have had. It says that God tested Abraham. From the very beginning, we know more than the characters in the narrative do. We as readers know that this is a test, but does Abraham know that? We are also given no explanation for this testing. When God says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, the emphasis here is very strong upon this relationship between Abraham and Isaac. Isaac is referred to four different ways. He is your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And this serves to highlight how horrible this event or this test is going to be for Abraham. 
Now, I doubt there is nothing worse in the world for a parent to lose a child. And here, Abraham is being commanded to kill his only son, the one he loves. After this story is over, the narrator is going to tell us about the death of Sarah. And the great Jewish sage Rashi illustrates how traumatic this story of Abraham offering up Isaac is. He wrote that when news of Abraham taking Isaac to sacrifice him on Mount Moriah reached Sarah, this was the cause of her death. What is also interesting in this story is that we are not given any information or hints about Abraham's inner struggle. He just goes along and does what is told in a rather matter-of-fact manner. He saddled his donkey. He took with him two servants. He cut enough wood. This makes us look beyond these narratively meaningless external events to ponder the thoughts of Abraham himself as he so matter-of-factly carried them out. I love it in my office because it looks out on the fountain down there and it's fun to just kind of look up and see them playing in the fountain every now and then. But I digress. Back to our story of Abraham, verse 4. On the third day, Abraham caught sight of the place in the distance. So he said to his servants, you two stay here with the donkey while the boy and I go up there. We will worship and then return to you. It's impossible to know what Abraham is thinking when he says, we will return to you. This raises the big question about what Abraham knew and what he was thinking. We know that he was commanded and he understood that he was to sacrifice Isaac. The second thing we also know is that he clearly understood that God intended to fulfill his promises through Isaac. How does he reconcile these facts? It's not clearly explained in the text, and this is one of the ways that as readers we engage it. The traumatic nature of this story forces us to engage and think, what is Abraham going through right now? Now, I mentioned earlier that there have been a lot of different interpretations put forward to explain this story over the centuries. And Abraham's response to his servants here is the basis for another view. Calvin wrote that this text involved how Abraham was to reconcile this command, sacrifice Isaac, with the promised seed of Isaac. And if Isaac is the promised seed and Abraham sacrifices him, then isn't that promise extinguished? And if the promise ex is extinguished, Calvin argues that he is cutting off the promise of salvation as well. The author of Hebrews in the Bible wrestled with this question as well. In Hebrews 11:17 through 19, the author suggests that Abraham believed that God would restore Isaac to him through sort of a resurrection or a resuscitation of his life. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and put it on his son Isaac, which gives you some idea as to the child's age, that he is old enough to carry a load, probably a fairly large load of wood. Then he took the fire and the knife in his hand, and the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, what is it, my son, replied Abraham. Here is the fire and the wood, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham replied. The two of them continued on together. The way this story is told here, I really get the impression that this is about the only dialogue that they're having, that the two of them are walking slowly and silently up this mountain, Abraham wrestling with what he has been commanded to do, and Isaac wondering what the heck is going on here. Isaac is the one who breaks the silence and asks a question about what this testing is all about. When Abraham finally breaks his narrative silence, his answer is, what is it? In Hebrew, it would be literally, here I am. Now Abraham's answer to Isaac is the same answer that he gave to God in chapter 12, verse 1. Isaac asks, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And this draws the reader into the central drama or need of this story. Abraham knows that he is commanded to sacrifice Isaac, but Isaac is portrayed as innocent and unknowing about this sacrifice that's about to take place. 
And then finally in verse eight, we get our first hint about what Abraham is thinking. He says, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering my son. Now this phrase, the Lord will provide, is where we get the name for God, Jehovah Jireh. This occurs midway through the narrative, and the writer allows the final words of this story to appear to be foreshadowed in this text, that God will provide, literally, that God will see for himself, or God will look out for and make his own provisions. In this answer, we finally get a glimpse as to Abraham's inner wrestlings and how he is resolving this dilemma that he's been placed within. Now, Abraham's response here that God will provide also points to another thing about this story. At the very beginning, we are told that God tested Abraham. Here, we are told that God will provide, and at the very end, we're going to see God provide the lamb. And so, in a certain sense, this story is more about God than it is about Abraham. 22, 9 through 12. When they came to the place that God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. Next, he tied up his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand, took the knife, and prepared to slaughter his son. But the Lord's angel called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he answered. Do not harm the boy, the angel said. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God because you did not withhold your son, your only son, from me. The writer seems to deliberately prolong the tension of both Abraham and the reader in this depiction of the last moment before God interrupted the action and called the test to a halt. Tied up is the verb where we get the title of this passage, the Akeda, and it comes off the Jewish verb to tie up or to bind. Now it's with particular regard to this binding that the Jewish authors really saw the role of Isaac and his virtues within the story being displayed. For example, Josephus tells us that Isaac was 25 years old when they went up onto Mount Moriah for this sacrifice. And he describes Isaac as joyfully throwing himself upon the altar, even though he escaped the fate that was awaiting him. Isaac conducted himself in a manner that is comparable to Abraham's faith. And the Akedah is as much an affair of Isaac's faith and obedience as it is Abraham's for Josephus. Irenaeus of Lyon seems to pick up this reading from the Jewish scribes as well. And he then applies it to our lives as believers. He writes that we too, holding the same faith as Abraham, carrying our cross as Isaac, the wood, we follow behind them. Abraham followed the commandment of the word of God, delivering up with a great heart his only and beloved son as a sacrifice for our redemption. In verse 12, when the angel tells Abraham, do not harm, literally that which should be translated as, do not extend your hand towards the boy. And you really get this picture that Abraham is extending the knife to slit Isaac's throat while he's upon the altar here. When the angel says, for now I know, the test was designed to see if Abraham would be obedient. But in the final analysis, the test is reciprocal. God discovers the level of Abraham's trust, and this is lived out through his obedience. At the same time, we as readers come to know that such trust is not misplaced. God is indeed faithful and trustworthy to his divine promises. Verses 13 and 14. Abraham looked up and saw behind him a ram caught in the bushes by its horns. So he went over, got the ram, and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord provides. It is said to this day, in the mountain of the Lord, provision will be made. Boy, we just had this breeze come across and it feels so nice. It is such a beautiful day. Okay, back to our story here. When Abraham named the altar in that place, the Lord will provide. This goes back to how he answered Isaac once again, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. By naming the place Jehovah Jireh, 
It transfers this story from one of child sacrifice to God's provisions. And it also provides the resolution for Abraham struggling within the story. He's received promises about Isaac and then he's got this command that seems to completely contradict that. But in the midst of this, what resolves the whole crisis is this whole idea of Jehovah Jireh that God provides. Now Abraham's destiny can be seen from several different angles. Number one it is a test of Abraham's obedience. Remember in Genesis, Abraham is portrayed as the model of obedience par excellence. Number two, it raises questions about God's promises and his requirements and how these two play out. How can God promise a great nation through his seed and then require that it be sacrificed? Number three, in the ancient world, this story may have served to sever Israel's faith from pagan practices. God commanded a child sacrifice, but then at the very last moment stops it. The way this story is told, the sacrifice was never going to happen, but Abraham didn't know that. In this way, it becomes a polemical argument against child sacrifices. Number four, it is also a test of God, the trustworthiness of God. Will God provide whatever is necessary for the fulfillment of his promises? Even when God appears to act in contradiction to those divine promises, God will provide the means of their fulfillment. Verses 15 through 18. The Lord's angel called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, I solemnly swear by my own name, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will greatly multiply your descendants, so that they will be as countless as the stars in the sky or the grains of sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the strongholds of their enemies. Because you have obeyed me, all the nations of the earth will pronounce blessings on one another using the name of your descendants. Now the promise here that I will indeed bless you really reiterates what we've seen in chapters 12, 13, 15, 17, and 18. And the blessing that's given here in verse 17 is very similar to the blessing that is given at the very start in chapter 12, verse 2. And it lets us see that these blessings bookend and run throughout the entire story of Abraham's life. And then this whole idea that the nations will participate in Abraham's blessing somehow in verse 18 is similar to that in verse 3. Once again, we see that these blessings that God sheds upon Abraham were meant for the whole world. I think this story stands behind some of the paradoxical statements that we see in the New Testament. For example, in Mark 8.35, it says that those who wish to save their life must lose it, and those who lose their life for the sake of the gospel will save it. Once again, we have this paradox where we must give up our life to save it, but if we're going to save our life, we're going to lose it. I don't know about you, but this story challenges me on so many levels. First, there's the utter horror of this story, the sacrifice of your child. If you don't wrestle with that fact, then I don't think you're engaging with the true crux of this story. Second, Abraham's obedience. He sets a really high bar for my life, one that I don't think I'm fully able to emulate, if I'm being honest with myself. Third, God's provision. Notice how God stands before them in this story when he demands Abraham sacrifice Isaac. We are told that this is a test. And then he is with them through the story, watching Abraham and Isaac travel, and he provides for them at the moment of their crisis. He already has a ram placed and entangled in the thickets for this moment. And then finally, after the test, God reiterates his promises to Abraham and to future generations. This was a tough story to teach. And in a certain sense, I guess I'm waiting for an easy heartwarming story to come along and teach. But the Bible is not a PG-13 type of book. And I think it's the rawness of some of these stories that challenge us and strike their lessons home deep within our hearts. Until next week, I hope you wrestle with this story within your own lives. And you can leave your thoughts and comments down below in the comment section. And I look forward to reading them. Remember to subscribe and let other people know about this channel as well. That really helps me a great deal. Until then, peace. Thank you.